Hi, I'm Adrian Sullivan. Welcome to episode three of the Coaching Playbook with this week's guest, Owen Roach. Owen is a specialist in the numbers that drive the modern game of hurling. So we have a really interesting chat about what the KPIs are in the modern game and what the top sides are tracking um, to keep track of their performance. We also have a really, really varied discussion on communication and the importance of different communication with various age groups and various teams. Owen is currently the Dublin under-14 manager. He's the coach of the FINA senior hurlers, who, as we're recording this, are in the county final. And he's also involved with the Fitzgibbon Cup team in DCU. So as you can see, he deals with players at all different sorts of levels. So his insight into communication is absolutely fantastic. Before we start, we would like to say a big thanks to the Irish Strength and Conditioning Network for sponsoring Series 1 of the Coaching Playbook. These things just simply are not possible without sponsors. The Irish S&C Network is a diverse coaching network that includes members from a wide range of fields, from S&C coaches, sports scientists and physiotherapists to scientists, to students even, hobbyists and anyone with an interest in coaching at all levels from grassroots right up to elite sport. As a listener of the Coaching Playbook, the Irish S&C Network are offering you a 30-day free trial. So simply go to the irishsncnetwork.com, use the code ISCN Play at checkout and you'll have access to all the fantastic content that is available on the site. So thanks for listening, like, subscribe, and sit back and enjoy this week's episode with Owen Roach. Okay, welcome to the Coaching Playbook, the Hurling Edition. I'm your host, Adrian O'Sullivan. Uh, today's guest has a, a storied history in hurling with nearly every team in Dublin now at this stage. The Dublin Senior Hurlers managed the DCU for Skipping Cup team. And I just said today he's back, back for another spin with him in the background this year. Uh, current Nafina senior hurling coach, manager of the Dublin under 14s, um, and co owner of the uh, very interesting um, No Plan BGA, the J Performance Pro uh, Process on Twitter. Uh, Owen Roach, you're very welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thanks, man, Adrian. Thanks, man, for having us. I left out one important bit. A true and true Limerick man as well, which is why you have Sean Finn's jersey <laughs> hanging there in the background. That's the most important oh, one of all that. I've long gone. I'm gone since '96. I don't think that's <laughs> happening. <laughs> yes, we, don't, we don't mention that. That'll be blocked out. That one, '96 will just be bleeped there. We still can't get over it. Yeah. Uh, Owen, for a man from a footballing part of West Limerick, it's fair to say I don't think anyone from around uh, Foyne the St. Sins would argue with that. Uh, you've fairly left your mark on Dublin hurling um, at the various different levels. Tell me a little bit about your coaching journey and how it all started for you. Uh, yeah, look, like like all of us, like coaching kind of starts at home. Um, very lucky that even though I am from West Limerick and from Fines, um, I'm from a hurling family. And, you know, you, as a young age, 10, 11, brought to Munster Championship matches, stuff like that. So a lot of the stuff would be from my, I have older brothers that would have hurled at a good enough level and my dad would have been big into hurling. So that's where the interest comes from, you know, um, being brought to places like, you know, club championship matches at nine and 10 years of age. I had an older brother that hurled with the likes of Kieran, Frankie, Beefy, Joe Quaid. So at, as a 10 year old, I was brought to Brough to watch them train under Bill Reedy. So I would have got a lot of, you know, my interest and the interest in coaching would have come from watching stuff like that over the years. Then obviously, like most people, you go to college, you end up in second year and you're asked to run a team. And that's where, and I was very fortunate to work under a fella called Eddie Murphy. Um, well regarded, highly known in Cork, Kerry, although did a bit with Bennett's Bridge, stuff like that. Brilliant, brilliant man. His enthusiasm for Harlan, his love of Harlan just like seeps out of him. So I would have had that and would have looked after two fresher teams when I was in Tralee. And then kind of parked that then for a couple of years when I went hurling myself and hurling in Dublin. And then luckily enough, and you say like being from West Limerick, being from a football background and stuff like that. Um, when you come to Dublin and you're involved in hurling in Dublin, all they care about is that you're a hurling person, not where you're from, not what you do, not your background or anything like that. If you have something to offer and in fairness, Colin Birch, you give me a call and uh, 10, 11 years ago now and asked would I get involved in a development squad and I jumped at it and got involved with actually the lad that works with me with No Plan B, Paul O'Brien, and another fella, Gary Driscoll, and they showed me the ropes and went from there. Yeah, that's a, it's it's interesting. It's just when you're saying there, obviously, we're from maybe two miles over the road from yeah. each other, and uh, like there's probably no hurling between our two houses, but we're just from a hurling family as well, so it's amazing yeah. to be the product of your environment. Yeah, um, That's all changing now as well. It's, it's amazing the impact a bit of success has like there, there's two guys from Jerry Griffins now which is only just over the road from us who had never really had much hurling at all 
um, on county development squads and stuff now. And uh, it, it's amazing. It's, it's a chicken or egg, you know, the success came and then the interest came. It's a, it's an interesting one. But um, I suppose you're you're obviously a coach and a manager own, but you've really started to kind of deep dive into the numbers that are driving her. And like that's that's what your Twitter page is, kind of looking at the analysis and the, the key drivers in hurling. When did you first start to get really interested into the numbers behind performance? Uh, the kind of the first interest, obviously, when you start in coaching, you're just kind of concentrating on what you can control yourself and you're looking at how you can be a better coach, how you can interact with the players. And as you develop, then you're kind of going, well, how can I make this better for myself? Like what do? And fortunately, even back as far as 2014, we were videoing a lot of our underage games in Dublin. So I was taking a look at them, analyzing them myself when we go when we leave it and come back and use it for training sessions and stuff like that. But then I got involved with uh, Johnny McGurk um, and Seamus Breslin uh, with the 2015, 16 Dublin minors and really kind of started building my coaching around it. I started getting numbers off Seamus started. Johnny would do his own form of analysis as well after games and talking to him and what he'd be looking for. And myself and Paul were involved in that setup, uh, 15, 16, very, very enjoyable successful enough not as successful as we should have been but we you know we competed got to a couple of all Ireland semi-finals and stuff like that and kind of saw the fruits of marrying numbers with coaching and analyzing with coaching and saw okay this works it's not it's not rocket science that the numbers and the coaching should be married together but um at that time it was though yeah it, was it probably really was at that time, Nick. yeah yeah, 10 years ago, it probably was, but yeah. uh, there was other people doing it. It just wasn't as out there as it is now. Um, mm -hmm. So then got involved with the seniors in 2019 and um, saw what Shane Carney was doing and kind of looked at that and kind of said, OK, so how can I make this better? You know, how can how can I take this? What they were doing was good. It was brilliant but how can I make this better for myself? And kind of went down the coach performance analysis route. Um, myself and Paul saw the the course in Carlo and go, okay, can we make this work for us? So we went two different routes. Obviously I, I, um, I had cancer in 19, so I couldn't do the course properly in 19. In fairness, brilliant people down there. Uh, Johnny Bradley, um, excellent to work with. He facilitated me, put me back a year. And uh, Paul did the course um, that year, found it brilliant. I was interacting with him, finding out he was showing me, sharing stuff with me that he was doing, showing me his assignments and his projects and going, OK, this is exactly how we can improve as coaches, how we can improve ourselves as analysts. And uh, started the course then in 2020 and did it during COVID on and off or whatever. And uh, yeah, really got into it and kind of. As I was doing it, it was, it was it was brilliant because we were in the infancy of what we were doing with Nafina at the time. So it was kind of marrying what I was doing with Nafina and what I was doing on this course and trying to, um, you know, implement what I was learning and put it onto the field. And uh, again, kind of successful, <laughs> got to a certain point, didn't get it over the line. But I think um, I think if you ask the players, more importantly, they've they've got um they've got something from it yeah it's i'm just laughing there at you you're saying kind of successful is i remember doing an article years ago about what is success you know and i thought yeah. you're you, i think in your own head there you're defining it that you didn't lift the trophy at the end of the final but um i'm sure you're like you know you know yourself and again i suppose the numbers help with this it's it's about improving day to day and kind of having yeah. that consistency and performance really is what success is unfortunately only one team will ever lift a bit of silver at the end of the at the end of the season, isn't it? And I suppose that's what you're kind of in your own head. You're you're saying it there, whether it's subconsciously or not. Yeah, there are things you have to battle with, you know. And I think you cover it well in your last question. And I think I'll answer it in I think in your last question on it. You know, so yeah, yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's something we all struggle with, isn't it? It is. Um, I suppose since you started doing that, Paul, and it's, it's interesting one because. I just had a chat with a guy in Limerick there the other day about something completely different. And we, were, we just got ended up talking about uh, performance analysis and stuff like that. And he kind of said that Limerick seniors didn't really start to really properly get into it until John Coyley came in in 2017 with Sean O'Donnell. So you're kind of talking there like you were at this in 14, 15, 16 kind of with, with the Dublin minors. So I think, I think you're doing yourself a bit of a disservice there to say like that you, that you weren't ahead of the game. I think you were definitely ahead of the curve with regards to what you were trying to do. 
I suppose since he started at that point, kind of around 15, 16 with the minors, up to the present day, what you're doing with um, with Nafina and, and what you've done with the Dublin teams in the last couple of years, what has changed with regards to what the key numbers are or, or what you're looking at with regards to performance in Hurling? Yeah, look, there's... This is all contextual and it's all to the team you're with. Um, mm-hmm. And it comes to something that while I was studying that I kind of stumbled across and, you know, learned. When we start... Um, when we start our hurling life at whatever young fellas out there now are starting in their nurseries at four. Um, so by the time you get to minor, you're 17 years of age now. So you have 13 years of hurling age. General lads start their strength and conditioning at 13, 14, some at 15, whatever. So you then have an S&C age of three, four, five, whatever it is. So it's the same with PA. It depends on when you start your PA life. Um, what we're trying to do, obviously, with Dublin 14s at the minute is start their PA life, life at 14, so by the time they get to minor. So the what we're what you can give and what you can do with a team is really based on what they can take in. You know, if they can't process the information, you can give them the best information in the world, but you can be looking back into that crowd and you can just see glazed over eyes. It happened to me with a Fitz team two years ago. I tried to implement stuff and I think you learn, obviously, from your mistakes more than your success. Uh, tried with the Fitz team two years ago to do too much too soon. Mm-hmm. Tried to feed them too much information. Tried to give them too much of a game plan and fell flat in my face with it. So while there is loads of stuff, like you can deep dive into the tackle, as as one of your questions will come to. Um, there is a lot of stuff out there on outcomes. We can all look at our puck outs. We can, you know, you can have 25 sharp puck outs. But what you do with that 25 sharp puck outs is the most important thing. What happens in second, third phase of that play is the most important thing. Are you getting into areas where you can damage the team? Are you working the ball out past your 65s? Loads of stuff like that. One of the things I like looking at myself is, is the deliveries. Who is delivering the ball? Where they're delivering it to? Who is winning the ball for the opposition? I like looking at that in opposition analysis because it gives you an idea of who are the key people that you can close down. Who can you stop? In the opposition analysis those things i think are vitally important mm-hmm. um obviously your tackle and you can talk as long and as much as you want it and again it comes back to what works for you what is the best definition of the tackle for you what do you want to marry the tackle with whether you want to marry it with possessions time whatever to get the best numbers out of it so all those things outcomes and deliveries are two of the things that i kind of uh, look on um my project in uh, college, my um, my thesis that I did on was connectivity, was looking at who connects, what players connect in a team, who is the most important. Um, that's all well and good from year to year because you can look at Keane Lynch plays as a deep-lying centre forward for Limerick. He's obviously going to be one of the most connected people on the field. Conor Burke two years ago was playing a P1, deep line center back, sweeper, whatever you want to call it. He was the most connected players. Uh, stuff like that can be very interesting, especially with the role of the goalkeeper in the modern sport, because mm-hmm. how many times are they going back to him? How many times is he really starting their attack from a big switch or a recycle ball? Stuff like that I find interesting as well. And I think there's that's things, the individual, looking at the individual and the role of where Pat Fell is playing, can be very important as well in modern day analysis. Yeah, no, that, that, that's really, really interesting. Um, we have a little bit of a peer group there, a coaching group, and there's a guy on it, Ronan the Burn, who would have been with Castle Knock there for the last yeah. couple of years. And he did a bit of a deep dive on ball delivery zones um, mm. with the Wicklow Hurlers so across two seasons. And then Colm Codd was with me in Dublin there. You know, I'm probably come across him, the yeah. very good guy. Uh, he would have done it with the Camogie. And then I got data from another team as well, a senior intercounty hurling team at a higher level than Wicklow. And it was amazing that they get three different levels, the correlation between the ball delivery zones, the ball retention and the chances created. It was almost as if we were kind of looking at it going, Geez, like, how have we not seen this before? Like, you know, it's like, it, it, it's yeah. almost like a formula. You get the ball to here, your chances of retaining it increase, your chances of creating chances increase. And it's just, so like, yeah, those kind of things, I think, whereas when I kind of started off at intercounty level, maybe 2015, 16, that just wasn't thought about. It was just it was just like a different language altogether, completely different. Um, but yeah, the connectivity thing is very, very interesting. Like, as, as you kind of touched on it there, 
like I think a lot of teams struggle on the transition with actually just linking the the defense and the attack. So I suppose it could be used to coach your own players as well. But I think the one thing that kind of resonated with me there was just trying to find those connectors and the opposition. And you know, obviously that will influence your man marking roles and and trying to trying to negate the opposition and stuff like that as well. So that's that's really really interesting. On I suppose the next question you've nearly almost answered really, but I know maybe not. I suppose we've talked a little bit about performance in matches and stuff like that, but. As a coach, then, and you take away these numbers, like how much do the numbers impact on what you do on the training pitch? Yeah, immensely. They, they have to marry. Like, they have to marry together. Like, what you're talking about there, let's say you're building your play from your back to your front. What is happening at the back and what is happening at the front, what's happening with your defenders building the ball out has to marry with the movement and the space that's been created by your forwards. So you can build the ball to the 65 as much as you want. But if you don't have the movement inside or the pockets opened up or, you know, the people inside doing the right things to be able to win that ball and open up the space for that ball to be hit into, then your numbers won't match up. So you have to marry everything in together. Mm -hmm. um, like you have to look at your puck outs, your sharp puck outs. If you're not getting success off your sharp puck outs, you have to ask yourself why. You have to marry your video analysis with your numbers. Okay, you look, okay, we hit 15 sharp puck outs. We only worked five past our 65. We only got three shots off. Why did that happen? So you go back, you, you have your number, you look at your video, you see what happened, and then you take it onto the pitch and you try and fix it. Or you hope that they fix it and you facilitate them fixing it. Mm -hmm. It's like, I suppose it's a slightly different thing as well, but obviously you, you're into both, right? You're a coach, I mm -hmm. suppose, that does analysis. Um, I think how, like, I think it's incredibly important. Uh, for me, the most important relationship access in a management team is the manager, the head coach, the analyst, and then obviously the S&C as well. But it, predict, like, if the coach, the analyst, and the manager aren't all on the same page, then you're at, you're absolutely at nothing really aren't you like i think it's so important definitely they, they, they need to be there needs to like it's like everything and um, there has to be relationships yeah you have to have a relationship uh, any teams that we work with the teams that generally have the more success are the ones that we have the good the ones that we have that 40 minute phone call going through what happened it's not just we give someone a number and they go away and do it we 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 put that into context and marry it mm -hmm. But the one thing that I would and I'd be a strong believer in, even down to under 14s, and from all the research I read, it, it's what you're talking about. You, there's the relationship between the coach, the analyst, the S&C. But the most important person has to come into that too is the player. And I found in the last few years, once the player is involved in that process, once you sit down to do your operational definitions, once you sit down to do what your KPIs are, and you involve the player in that process it makes it an awful lot easier to uh implement it because they're part of it yeah. you know so like um i asked a player yesterday just a quick example asked the player uh that i've been involved with for four years to give me uh just describe um our puck outs on on a certain time of the time of the game just send me on for them so i can do up a graphic for other players mm -hmm. and he actually sent me a powerpoint with the breakdown with it done with the graphic on it so that'll tell you the journey he's been on for yeah. three or four years he's been with me. he's able to now because he's been in this process for three or four years he could send me a powerpoint with those puck outs on it so that's kind of the place you want to take them mm, that's class it's like I, I saw the i haven't actually watched it back just yet but the the webinar that shawnee o'donnell did with the performer um but i saw the clip one of the clips on twitter was just about, and I suppose it, I'd be interested to get your insight into this now, as you said, starting the performance journey with, with under 14s or the analysis journey with under 14s, the importance of them having a positive experience. And I did a little bit of a social experiment this year at Galway, and I probably, <laughs> I don't know, ethics or anything to do it, but I used to send the players um, five or six clips completely out of context, no title on them, no comments on them, and just ask them for their feedback. Yeah, and I tr always try and weigh the clips like sixty percent positive and forty percent improvements, mm. and they nearly all come back with a negative comment on every clip. Whatever process they'd gone through in their early career, they were just constantly looking for the negative. I just thought it was really okay. interesting, really yeah. interesting insight. Uh, yeah, would have done something very similar with the fourteens actually. But what we do is we play the clip 
um, without a graphic, without, we do it in a group setting. So we'd have, what we started off is very small. We have um, a 30 minute PA meeting uh, after they played, let's say two or three games. Mm -hmm. And you'd play the clip with no graphic, no explanation in it and put it to the floor. Give me the positive or negative from this clip. And generally, in fairness to them, they picked up on it fairly well and everything, like there was obviously a couple of, because hurling is the way it is now, you have a lot of these lads that are in um, rugby schools. So they've had exposure to it, uh, to PA, so they know what they're looking for. So you would have a few like that and then you have to develop the other lads that wouldn't have any. But in general, the same kind of concept. But I'd have to say, no, you will. Uh, we built that up then to them doing individual clips on their own clips, putting their own stuff on huddle. And we did get one or two that were pulling three negatives, no positive. And yeah. yeah, you have to you have to address that and say, look, you have to look at what you do well too, and you have to look at how you how you can improve what you're doing well and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah definitely. It's kind of I suppose when when you're 13 or 14 as well, it's just such an Irish thing as well. We don't want to admit we're good at anything either, do we? Like, and you're kind of going. I'm going to show the coach now that I'm like, I'm really willing to improve here. I'm going to put all the negative stuff now on the jaw. It's like, it's kind of, the, that's the kind of mindset you're in when you're a young lad to a certain extent. You're afraid to go, oh, do you know what? I am class when I turn on to my left and, and step back onto my right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. And it, it's positive reinforcement for them as well. Seeing them doing positive things, you know, um, and understanding that, which is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I suppose... That, that so a different question is slightly go off time yeah. it's a question i wanted to ask there about 30 seconds ago but if we go back to what we're talking about what you're doing on the training pitch and we're talking about that connectivity and movement and link and everything i suppose i would be one of these guys that went absolutely up to my neck in games based stuff right around 2014 15 16 and and would nearly have sneered at the idea of uh of uncontested or patterns of play or anything like that and I suppose, like looking at the likes of Bielsa and these guys, then like it's all patterns of play and stuff like that. Like, how much non-contested or uncontested patterns of play stuff would you do to try and improve that? I suppose that link or that symphony between kind of transitioning the ball from defence to the connectivity to the movement in attack and stuff like that. Or what's your balance when you're trying to get that right? Again, it's it's dependent on where you are on it. And um, if you're trying to start it off, and if you're trying to you know, implement it initially. Um, you have to go uncontested to get it to work, to let them to see how it happens. And then it's built um, through the year that like you're building out play, you, you, you put two blockers in uh, and then you build it up to where you are getting into championship and you have the full six on six, you're building out, you have it as match scenario as possible. But to start something off and even sometimes... Uh, we do it fairly regularly in one of the teams I'm with on um, on match week. We will do just a simple uh, build a play of put players of where they would be on the pitch. Let's say you're someone in full back line, Marion with someone in a half back line. He's going to be feeding the ball to midfield and you have the delivery completely uncontested. Just so they're doing the movement, they're doing, they're replicating what you'd hope to do in the field. Mm -hmm. So I think it's it has to be this situational of where you are in the process of it and also what you're preparing for mm -hmm. you know so yeah we would do both um and we would actually break it down with the 14s especially and with younger teams you'd actually maybe take some of the pitch out of it so you're actually breaking it down to areas of the pitch that okay yeah. this is kind of what we want to do here and then we'll build it up to what we do further up the field then at a later date mm -hmm. so little things like that so it doesn't have to be full pitch, if full contested all the time, because generally when you're trying, and it can be the most frustrating thing when you're standing with a whistle in the middle of the field, it, it breaks down. And <laughs> um, and it's, and it's a, as frustrating for the player. So you want it to work and then to build on it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think like we're, we're naive as coaches if we don't use the uncontested stuff, because if you're trying to rep something and program it, the only way to guarantee that you're going to get the number of reps required to kind of, make it semi-automatic obviously you have to have the decision making part of it and all that is to rep it because you put it into a match situation the scenario you're looking for might only happen two three four times you can try and create it as much as you want but as soon as you have the contest and the turnover and the tackle it's going to stop it from happening so you kind of have to unorganically nearly create it so 
I think that's a very interesting takeaway on for, for anyone that's listening. On the flip side of that, um, I found the best fixes come when it does break down and that contested. 100%. You know, and, and the player's input in that of, let's say, the different presses that all teams are doing on sharp puck outs and stuff like that, and finding that fix, you know, when it does break down, mm-hmm. you you, you have like you have to get to that contested part of it to get the real learnings out of it. But I understand that you have to build on it too. Yeah, on on that, you know, um, how much video analysis do you do of your training sessions? Say, if you're looking at at really working on something really important, something that's really fundamental to to how you play, will you get the camera out and have a look at it? And or unfortunately, what? unfortunately, not. No, mm-hmm. um, I. I don't think I've ever worked with a setup that's video the training and it's something that that has to be done mm-hmm. that should be done um and, and I just haven't worked with a setup that that, that have done it yeah I um, said so right when I got Cullum into Dublin Camogie when the first nights he rocked down it's him rocking down with the camera over the shoulder I was like yeah. where are you going with that and he's like sure something might happen should we record a session and something might happen I was like all right so then we, we started getting a bit more specific with it then it was just like Look, if we're working on something really fundamentally important, let's uh, let's record it. But what what I found it good for as well, on is look, we've all been in situations here where we start hit championship time, mm. and you've thirty three or thirty four players in the panel, and only maybe twenty are getting game time. And like one of your biggest challenges always as a manager is keeping that keeping that interest in the in the players kind of from twenty three to thirty five, and not just keeping interest, but getting valuable game tape for them yeah. to actually give feedback so that they can improve because that's the hardest thing so we would like if we were playing a 20 minute game and training on a tuesday night call them and record it and then we just we tag it the same way as we would a normal game so then even if you're not getting championship game time at least you've something to come back to the coaches with look can you give me feedback on this or whatever so i definitely i definitely recommend it i like i wouldn't go completely ott where you're recording every minute of every session and we wouldn't have the time anyway as amateur coaches yeah. you just wouldn't simply have the time but I think there is good value in it. Like, you can use it in different ways to 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 keep the keep the improvement going in the squad. You know, definitely, definitely, and it's something that hopefully I'll get to look at in uh, with development squads. Yeah. Um, next question is a kind of a follow on to to the training ground, I suppose. On match days, how influenced are you by the numbers when you're making changes? So they could be tactical changes, substitutions. What part does it play in your decision-making process on match day? It would play a, a big part in what we do, yeah. Uh, but, again, there has to be context in what's happening. You have to marry. And sometimes we, it's become less important, but there is a coaching instinct as well to what you see, you know, and you have to be able to implement that and marry that with the number. With the, with the groups I'm with at the minute, we don't have feeds so you don't have footage um so you have to go off your coaching instinct marry that with the with the numbers and marry that then with uh what's happening on the pitch like it's dependent on what the opposition what way they're playing um if they're sitting half back lines back you're not going to get the same red zone deliveries that you would you would want so you have to adjust that if you're dominating the game are you getting the same number of tackles that you would normally be getting in in a game um one of our big numbers is is a 60 40 it's kind of a ball that you should be winning you know that touch on the ground that you should be winning mm-hmm. and we find that it, it's not my number it's actually nigel o'hara's number he came up with the concept and he he got me to define it and to and to and to measure it um that for us is a very very good um indication of how we're going um because it kind of it looks at kind of the mentality that the mindset the boys are in if they're winning those balls that they should mm-hmm. be winning it kind of is a good indicator and if our numbers are good there it is a very good uh indicator of how we're going as a team and if they're poor it generally you know the mindset's <laughs> not right the application's not right so we're not winning those balls we should be winning mm-hmm. you that's know the, so the fantastic thing about analysis on is that like i've never heard of anyone using something like that specifically before so obviously you've come up with that number that works for you guys. Like, Joe, you know, like it's it's not a perfect uh, science, no. is it? Like, it's like you just have to find whatever works for you and adjust it. And uh, but when I initially heard of it, I didn't think it could be defined. I said, "How do you <laughs> look?" At it? Yeah, I was kind of going, "How yeah. do we define this? How do we look at it?" And we came up with a definition that worked for us. And it's kind, of, it's 
after the ta- well, with the tackle, it's kind of our main, it's our main number. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think that's a, that's a huge takeaway for anyone, anyone listening to this that's kind of maybe trying to implement anything with their own club or their school team or whatever it is. Is that, yeah, there are certain numbers like we spoke about, you know, ball delivery zones and and puck outs and all this that look they're consistent across everyone's um, performance analysis. But like, don't be afraid to go and find something that works for you. It doesn't exactly even if someone else thinks it's stupid. If it works for you and if it's if it's achieving the desired outcome for your team. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about it, really, does it? Like it's 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 specific to your team. Like, yeah, definitely. You know? Um, that's interesting. The on tackles in, we've mentioned tackles a few times. Mm. Was this a kind of a I'm on a bit of a tackle journey as an analyst, really? I'd say nearly every hurling uh hurling uh, coach is really on it. Was it it's it's so hard to define the tackle these days with the way the game has gone and and all that, and you, there's all the different definitions of it, but I suppose. Uh, when I came in with Dublin first, we had Ray working with us. And we would have argued tooth and nail about this. And uh, looking back, I can kind of see where he was coming from. So he, the Dublin wouldn't have been the hardest working team, wouldn't have been necessarily known as the hardest working team in Camogie by any stretch. And he, I suppose, wanted to create an environment where the players just had tackles as one of their primary focuses. And the, his big kind of mantra for the year was the team who tackles the most wins the game, right? And I suppose I would have questioned it at the start. I was kind of like, but surely if we're dominating the game, like this isn't going to be transferable and trackable across different games or whatever. But he just he insisted with it. And look, it worked for us because it put tackles to the to the front and foremost of what we were doing. So straight away our intensity, our driving games went up, right? So it obviously achieved what he was trying to achieve. But then um when Colum came in, he was just kind of saying, Look, this isn't this isn't something that you can track from game to game if you're just ta- tracking the tackle count. We've no way of knowing whether we're working harder or less than the previous game. So we, he came up with a thing called just a work rate ratio. So it's kind of from taken from the Premier League where it's we tracked our number of tackles for every 10 opposition possessions. So we knew then that it didn't matter whether the opposition had 100 possessions or 200 possessions, our ratio to that should be the same. Or draw, we should track it from game to game. And I know Limerick, Sean O'Donnell does it per minute of opposition possession, which is kind of something similar. Probably it draw it's probably a bit more accurate than what we were doing, really. Um, if you really want to boil down into it. What is your view on that? And how do you track it? And how do you make sure that it's something that you can track consistently from game to game? So we kind of look at it more into ourselves we don't look at it as um as the opposition mm-hmm. so what we do is is what i spoke about earlier is the outcome so why do we tackle we tackle to get the, the ball back we tackle to turn over the ball so we have a process of you have your tackle yeah and we have a different definition to everybody else and it works for us and that's what we use it for so then we look at well why do we tackle so we tackle to get the ball back so we, we look at we look at our turnovers and when a team is going well, it works in a two to one ratio. Generally, from what I've done, the couple of the 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 sample I took, and from the games I looked at, if you're having a good performance, you're generally turning over the ball once in every two tackles. So that's generally what happens. So then you look at it. Then what happens? Are we getting scores from turnovers? So once you get that ball back. Once the opposition are unstructured, because you have them, they're on the ball, they're breaking out, they're doing something that they want to do with the ball, you've turned that then over, they are now in the vulnerable position. So how many scores are you getting off that? So we look at that. It's the process of getting your tackle. We have a very, um, it's very solidly defined. So our number, like I hear people hitting, 80, 90, 100 tackles, we wouldn't get anywhere near that because it's a different <laughs> definition. Yeah. So we want to get turnovers to that, and then we want to get scores from the turnovers. Yeah. No, I, I'm just laughing there because when we did the Galway this year, I think we analysed a couple of games. I think Cullum came out with, a, with they had 25 tackles in a game from the previous season. And the manager was like, no way, we had 90 tackles. <laughs> they were like, no, nah, that's <laughs> and, uh, completely for sure. Joy, they were consistently tracking it last season. So if they had 85, 90, 95, it worked for them. But it's just, yeah, yeah. We'd, be, we'd be quite strict. Quite strict. I think if you're very strict, this this is this would be my takeaway. If, you, if you're very strict on your definition of the tackle, the players chase them more. Like if you're too loose with it and, and I'll stray a hand in a bit of contact as a tackle, 
you kind of that's the standard you accept in within your squad whereas if you're if you really make a player work for it they know when they've achieved it you're just your intensity and everything goes up but an interesting thing that we spoke about there earlier on you're talking about joe you know, the buy-in from the players and yes the impact your players can have on you and stuff like that you talked there about teams being vulnerable when they're coming out the ball i can remember one of the very first things or feedback we got from players when we were talking about uh the press in my second year in dublin it was actually ashley mar that said like guys as a forward unit, we have to understand that the opposition are at their most vulnerable when they're coming out the ball. If we can turn them over, then they're not structured. We can go for goals. So we kind of we brought in this thing that every time we turned a team over inside their own forty-five, that we went for goal, regardless. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's just it goes back to that point you made initially. It's like like we sometimes I don't know we don't sometimes forget that's but you you can sometimes lose sight of the fact that your biggest tools are your players and. Your biggest information feedback is your players. Like they're the yep. ones who ultimately are out there, you know. So it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, we're going to move on to some general questions on. So yeah. the, all the guests I've had on, I've asked them kind of the same questions. I'm just I'm fascinated with how all different coaches will try and arrive at the same point, but go in a completely different way about it in a completely different direction. So I'm just interested to 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 hear your answer. So look, a lot of our listeners will be club coaches. Okay, look, the vast majority of coaches in the GA are club coaches at at, grow, at grassroots level. You've been lucky enough to coach at all sorts of levels, county, third level, club. Um, do you approach club differently to county with regards to performance analysis? And if so, in what way? So it goes back to your pH. It goes back to your player, what exposure they've had. Um, again, you can't start throwing stuff that you would at an inter-county setup at a club player and expect him to absorb it. And it goes back to my story with the Fitz team two years ago of expecting them to understand stuff that I was doing with a team that had three years or two years of PA experience where they had, now it, it varied from county, because obviously with your with your Fitz team, it varies mm-hmm. from county to county. So you, you have to go in and establish where their level is. And with most teams, you have to go for the, the lowest common denominator um, to see where you can start that and where the, your process can begin. And it's just, some of it is trial and error, but some of it will be from, you You can, you know, with teams, you do a session with them and you get a feel for the room, from the feedback, from the interaction, from what they're saying. Can these take on more or can they take on less? Or where do we need to, where do we need to adjust it? I was involved with a team at the start of this year and started off with what I thought was a fairly, you know, um good place to start with a team that wouldn't have but found then that i had to adjust it and really really uh peel it back and build it up slowly and gradually and by the time then that they'd finished their their season they were at a an okay level mm-hmm. but even for uh even for me um the first initial meeting i had with them i realized that they were not in a place to take on let's say what we were working off maybe six or seven variables you know numbers that they had to look at yeah so i had to peel that back to maybe one or two for the first few months build that up to three or four and then build it up to more stuff with video and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and like that's that can be quite hard at the moment i suppose like there's so many challenges whether you look at club or county like if you look at the county season now it's quite short so i suppose if you're going in there with underage county team or that and their pa age is low as you say you don't have a whole pile of time really to 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 layer it up so i suppose uh, simplicity is probably best there on i suppose look if you look at club then like, like my probably last experience with club was uh, at air rogan in us for two years and we spent most of the year with 13 or 14 guys gone to the clare senior hurling football teams so like you're kind of going well there's much point doing performance analysis here because the lads are only getting club back in for the week before the game so i suppose like I, one of my key takeaways I'm taking from this conversation with Joe, and I was I'm learning from all the the lads I'm chatting to as well as well as interviewing them, is just to be aware of that PA age, I suppose, and and not to not to go too hard too quickly. There's also buy-in as well. Like every team has that hierarchy of that leadership group or that players, certain group of players that are up here, and if you can get that group to buy into what you're doing like that that's half your battle as well so there is an element of that to getting them and and that's about involving them in the process too so they are involved so when you're 
for want of a better word, selling this to the players that they that they buy into it. What's your trick? We all have tricks, right? If what's if you if I said to you in the morning, listen, there's a group of lads inside there and they've no more interest in video analysis now. What's the one thing that you'll kind of try and find in their performance that you think they can this will be a, what's the low-hanging fruit? What's what's the what's the handy thing that you can go, all right? I, I definitely piqued their interest with this now. If you can identify something that is obviously not working for them, um, and if you can show them how to fix it and you can fix it on the pitch and fix it with video. So if you can relate all three or four things and show them, okay, take a look at this. This is why it's not working. We're mm -hmm. going to go out on the pitch here. We're going to do two or three things. And I'm telling you, this will improve it. We'll go back and look at this next week. So if you can find that thing, mm -hmm that is troubling either the team's performance or the individual's performance. You can identify it, you can fix it, and you can show them how it worked. Mm -hmm. I think you can get buy-in buy in then. Yeah. And look, we all know um, wins help this process. Mm -hmm. And yeah. once you win a couple of games and you show that, look, this is what we did, this is how we improved it, um, and it, it can be a lot more difficult when you're not getting those wins, but you yeah. have to go back and still go through the process of showing, look, we did this, this worked. But yeah, it's um, been able to identify something, uh, yeah. show them how it's working, or show them how to fix it and how to, how, how to implement it on the pitch. Yeah. That works. Yeah. I, sometimes if I find if five players that I feel aren't buying into it, I'll, I'll deliberately give them the wrong stat. As I say, okay. well, well done on your, your two great tackles there at the weekend. And you can kind of see the cogs kind of go on. And next thing they come back to you a couple of days later going, hey, I went down to huddle there, I had four tackles. Oh, geez, yeah, did you? <laughs> great stuff, come on. <laughs> so no, just, yeah. <laughs> different ways to do it. Definitely. Yeah, different ways to do it. Uh, if you could give any club coach, I suppose, and this is the key thing here, with limited resources, because look, we are be lucky we've been involved in teams there, no problem with cameras, huddle, all this, right? But that's not going to be the case for the vast majority of guys, right? So um, if, it, if there's any club coach out there with limited resources, three easily implementable tips to take away from your county analysis experience that they could apply at club level without needing to break the bank or go looking for resources. There is, even without going to the free um, software that's on, that's out there, like, Pen and paper is king. You know, at the end of the day, you, if it's very, you don't need any software, you don't need any fancy stuff to talk to your players, talk to your coaches and go, can we establish our KPIs? Can we establish our definitions? And get somebody that you trust within your group that has an analytical mind that's able to record on the day. And if you're only looking at one, two, or possibly just three things, on a game day that's easily done mm -hmm. um that's very easily done on pen and paper yeah like you don't have to have like it's brilliant if you can if you can have the yeah, ipads course, and you yeah. can have the live feed and you can have all of this and you can have all your live gps and everything's gonna that's beautiful but the fact of the matter is they all have cost a lot of money and clubs can save an awful lot by doing an awful lot themselves mm -hmm. by training up someone to be able to understand what a tackle is and to know what a tackle is and it's basically starting from the bottom so everybody knows your definition everybody knows what your variables are your kpis or whatever you want to call them and they're able to go out watch your game and say okay that's a tackle that's not a tackle that's a turnover that's not a turnover that's a um, a delivery from between the 65s or whatever it is and they're able to identify that so without even getting into the free software you can do that yeah. But then getting on, there is an amount of free software out there for analyzing video like iMovie and stuff for doing biomechanics. If you just simply Google it, there's an amount of stuff there where you can actually break down um, free taking. You can break down stuff like that. It's all free software. Mm -hmm. um, that's very easy. Got You don't. OK, Huddle is brilliant. Naxport is brilliant. All those things if you want to pay the money for them mm -hmm. are good but um there is free stuff out there yeah. it is very easy to clip stuff on iMovie and share it on your whatsapp group very simple and you can still add a small bit of graphics a small bit of um a small bit of text and explanation and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but then if you want to get into like the basic package on huddle 
is not mad money considering no, what's what's out yeah. there. Yeah. And for what clubs are paying some Coaches. people some things, <laughs> Coaches, yeah. 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 This is a far better investment. You know, and yeah. even when we're working with teams that are outsourcing us, we would, you know, tell them this is a way better way of spending your money. Yeah. You know, because you're educating your coaches, you're educating your players, you're educating your manager. Everybody's on the same thing. Everybody can interact on it. You can see what people are doing. And we all, as coaches, we love contact time. We love contact mm -hmm. time. And this is a way of doing it remotely. This yeah. is a way with you to engage with your player remotely. I'm I'm not as au fait with Performa as mm -hmm. I am with, with Huddle. I, I'm sure there's ways of uh, that doing it as well. But I know from Huddle, it creates relationships, yeah. you know, with your players and between the coaches, you know. And you do have a certain amount of players that are, they're not really good socially, you know, that they're not good at interacting. And mm -hmm. I found even from the 14s that I have a, group of lads that much prefer discussing this with you on this kind of platform because this is what they're That's used to they're used to yeah yeah, yeah. you know yeah and they're, they're way better at expressing themselves in text than they are actually talking to an adult which is completely understandable for a 13 14 year old kid yeah of course yeah no i didn't say it's yeah um i'm a bit of a huddle disciple now as well but it's probably because it was the first thing i was showing i'm an iphone disciple as well because i just can't use samsung so it's probably it's yeah. more my my own lack of flexibility more than anything i'd say when it comes to it but because you say the 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 cheaper package is great but look we use a mixture in Galway this year like we use pen and paper for some stuff use the ipad for some stuff i think you can find a solution that works for you um and a really interesting thing on that and it's only something i was talking about the other day is like not to uh, interest your take on this not to get too caught up on the accuracy of what you do on match day because obviously hurling's a mad game it's like you're not going to get everything bang on but if you get it to a point where it's accurate enough to inform decision making well you can go back and look at the video after then and actually properly analyze the game i think someone told me today that shawnee shawnee o'donnell deletes the photo the the stats after the live game just he says that they're they're pointless really it's like it's it's fine on the day it's accurate enough on the day but it's irrelevant to actually giving accurate feedback to the players and stuff so i don't know what your own take on that is it something similar no i fully agree no i'm not i i don't do in-game stuff I'm, 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 yeah. I'm not good enough to do it. It, it it's a skill in itself it that it that is much much harder than yeah. uh, post game because you, you don't got no record mm -hmm. or, or five second back or whatever you want to do um, yeah, we'd be the very same. We tried to correlate the the in game stuff and the post game stuff uh, with a couple of teams, and it's just yeah, you can't do it. No, you know because you need an army of lads to do it. You need you an would. absolute army of lads and about fifteen iPads, <laughs> and they, they, they won't. Now you you obviously get the basic stuff like your puckouts and your shots. They have to marry, but yeah. you're in then the debate like when a tackle is made is it a tackle or not or what area of the field like you're, you're taking the quick look and you're trying to mark it so yeah post game trumps everything but your in-game stuff is vitally important because that is what you have at that time yeah i, I won't give too many specifics here though no, it hangs someone out to drive i remember being at an inter-county game one day and uh we were all radioed up and it came down over the radio mark kavanagh had uh had six possessions or no had four possessions already we'd want to push up on him and i was kind of there going i'm pretty sure he's six points from play <laughs> in my own head so it's like is he jesus christ like is he turning four possessions into six scores you know, like water water and wine. Wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah anyways we won't go too much into that um who is the person on that you've worked with who has most influenced your coaching style um yeah I, good good think about this um and i suppose you have to marry your good experiences with your bad experiences too because you you know off those bad experiences you have gee, i've had loads you have to take out of that but and the positive ones like i go back to obviously as a young fella, my old flat coached me an awful lot now today we don't agree on anything <laughs> because harlan has changed <laughs> but yeah, my outfit would be, you know, a big influence on what, what I've done coaching wise. Uh, but Eddie, Eddie Murphy in, in Tralee would have been massive. There's actually a fella that was over Crokes for a while and he, he probably keel over if he thought that I was complimenting him because we did not get on a fella called Morgan Lawler. But I was 30 years of age and Morgan actually taught me at 30 how to play properly in an inside forward line. I did not know 
how to play as a proper inside forward mm -hmm. until I was 30. And he was able to do that. And the way he went about it was, was excellent. But um, then in the last couple of years, like, and you go back to your positive experience as well, like Paul O'Brien is a massive, and when you talk about coaching edge, Paul is younger than me by maybe six, seven years. I'm not too sure. He's nearly hitting the 40 now, but he's not quite <laughs> there. But Paul would have a good six or seven years coaching experience more than me. So I would have learned an awful lot off Paul. And obviously Paul is the, the partner in um, the performance process. But then there's a lad from Marinogs, Gara Driscoll. Um, when I started, I don't know if you know Gar, but Gar has been involved in an awful lot of successful teams with Dublin up. He's off traveling the world now and whatnot. But um, he taught me how to, how to coach kids, how to coach kids properly, how to interact, how to be able to, you know, when we were growing up, how that coach would roar and shout at you and the dogmatic approach. And he taught me how to get kids to actually do what you want them to do, you know, in a good, friendly environment. Uh, he, he was brilliant and still is. I got him out as a, as a, what you call a coach, a, um, a one-off there with the 14s this year, and he's still as good as ever. You know, really, really good guy, really good coach and knows how to coach people. Yeah, so they would that kind of that would be kind of it those kind of people would have influenced me the most yeah the, the the big takeaway there for me and something i would have struggled with as a younger coach is kind of you're looking at these guys in, in maybe club or county teams or 29 30 31 you're kind of going sure like there's much point doing much with them sure they kind of they know it all or or that so i suppose it's very that was a, that's a good uh an interesting point for me your takeaway for me there i know you're saying at 30 you're still able to take on take on the coaching and, yeah. and and be shown something, you know. So I think that that's a huge takeaway for, for coaches. If you're going into a club or county team there in the morning, there's older players there, not to presume. And you were obviously open to it as well. Like, well, you're saying... No. You're, you're, no. <laughs> that was the most impressive thing. I was actually about to stop myself. Yeah, you're saying he's going to be... Well, you did say he's going to be shocked that you're praising him. So maybe you weren't too open. I was still to wanting to take pints over the shoulder on the sideline and couldn't move <laughs> even out to get the ball. But uh, he actually showed me that, no, this is not how you hurl. This is not how you play a 15-man game, you know. Yeah. So it was the way he did it. It was how he could show me and you know, taken onto the pitch and actually make me visualize what I was doing wasn't benefiting the team and how to benefit the team. Mm -hmm. well, that's, that's, look, that's the essence of coaching, isn't it? That's that's what it is. Um, I suppose, Owen, tell me what does the day of a training session look like for you? Um, and just maybe walk me through the outline of the usual session, whether that's kind of like the prep you do for it or what kind of interaction you'd have with the other coaches or, or with the manager if you're the, if you're the coach. Well, again, it's 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 different to where you fall. Like obviously with um, DCU and and on the fourteens this year, I would be manager, so I kind of outline what's going on and stuff like that. With Nafina, I'm part of a cog where we've got two other very good coaches, and Mike Dwyer and Nigel O'Hara. Um, so in relation to that, what generally happens is um, we have what we want to do to work on. We will have analyzed the game or games we've had in the last two weeks. We'll have decided. Um, Take, for example, our puck outs that we're not getting enough. I know I'm going back to that again, but it's the easiest one to visualize that we haven't been getting enough off our sharp puck outs that we'll go, okay, this block of the session here, we got 20 minutes assigned to this, but we make it flow into something that's related to it. So it's not just landing something in a session for the sake of it. Nigel designs the session, so he'll decide what we work at the start, whether it's those 60-40s we need to improve on. Then we'll flow it into um, that game-based stuff. And then we'll finish it off on something else that we need to work on, whether that's game based or it's finishing or something like that. So you take the analysis, you meet with the coaches, you process what you want to do. Somebody leads that, whether it's me with whatever fits 14s, whatever, whether it's Nigel with Nafina. Um, we give people their roles and their jobs and we know what everybody's doing. It's shared then with the players. So there's also you have the outline of what happens from minute one to mm -hmm. minute whatever it is 70 or 75 but if you also send the the video the graphic or the 30 second clip of the exercise you're doing so you're not landing in and okay everyone's not going to take it on board mm -hmm. but if you got 60 70 percent of it that know what's happening i think flow is a bit better and the time like the one thing that i would be strong on is you're doing not talking you know um Okay, talking, you have to talk. At some stage, you have to stop the <laughs> session, bring them in, 
talk what's working, what's not working, why isn't it working, why is it working, whatever it is. But if you're spending 15 minutes or 10 minutes or even five minutes, I think, in my own opinion, with a, they're zoning out, they're gone. Yeah. They want to be doing and they want to be. So if you take a couple of those minutes away by sharing the graphic of the actual exercise, um, it speeds up the whole process. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's generally it and again it's the information from the player um did an exercise on tuesday night i married two exercises together one worked well one did not work at all and it's those 30 seconds after the exercise asking the players well why didn't it work what could we have done better um and it's adapting it and the next time we'll go at that is making sure that it, it, it is a bit better it's not going to be perfect but to understand why it didn't work and for the players to give the input and uh i think it's so important that the players have their input in that that you're not just telling them well this didn't fucking work because you didn't do x y or z yeah. that they understand why it didn't work or why it did work more importantly then as well yeah i just laughing here now because uh orla from sideline live the only time she ever came out to watch me coaching uh pretty much the very first thing we did went completely arse overhead just did not work pull the players in and say right I had an inkling, I had it set up wrong. I was like, I was like, no, okay. That's the players. They're like, yeah, we're not really sure. I said, okay, we'll explain it again. We went again. Same again. It was worse. I <laughs> just said, right, we move on. I was like, the order. I was like, you know what? You probably came out now looking to see a very slick uh, session here now and, and all this, but you'll probably learn more from seeing me make a complete hames of it here and, and, and moving on. Sometimes you just yeah. have to go, right, look, we'll review it again. It could be me, it could be the players, but let's park it for the night. We'll move on to the next part of the session and, we we'll come back to it, Joy. Yeah, uh, you can't have too much of an ego to keep to keep trying to hammer it home when it's just not working. No, and like I said before, you you, you learn more of it when it fails, you know. And it's not going to work perfectly on the pitch on match day. So yeah. the players have to understand if this breaks down, what can we do to fix it? Yeah, and that that to me, I I think I could be wrong because I don't have any inside information. That's where Limerick are making their gains. Is they're way better at fixing stuff on a pitch than anybody else yeah big time they react so much better to, to what the opposition are throwing them i'm a big believer in that train ugly as well you know it's like you have to like it's if you can cut too caught up as a coach is everything looking perfect and it's like you, you learn from training ugly but that particular night it was too ugly <laughs> we, had, we had to move on um what are the three non-negotiables for any team you're involved in yeah i i took a bit of time in this and i kind of I got thing, three things down, but I'm kind of going, okay, the, to have non-negotiables, there's a lot of people involved here. You know, there is the other coaches around you, you know, mm -hmm. and your manager and everybody, you know, mm -hmm. that have to be able to agree on these. And some of those things that you might have your rocks might be the most important things for the other people in your group. Yeah. You also, again, have to include your players. But to cut a long story short, honesty, I think has to be top and mm -hmm. it goes back to your mistakes like um i'd fits team a couple of years ago where there was a lot of really really good hurlers on it and you find yourself in a situation you know you only can get 15 on a field but you're telling fellas half truths to keep them involved and i two relationships that went very very wrong two fellas that i would have had since they were 15 in that where um because i was plum awesome yeah sugarcoating it a bit sugarcoating it yeah, yeah. can and, i ask you can, uh, I, can i put in for a second on were you yeah. sugarcoating it were you sugarcoating it for the player or were you trying to make it easier on yourself to deliver the message bit of both bit of both i was sugarcoating it for the player to keep him you know on that league period where you don't have everybody because lads are involved with clubs and stuff like yeah. that I wasn't giving them the full honesty of where they were in the pecking order. And then once we got the championship, um, you know, and, and, and look at what you call it, Fitz and, and O'Connor and Ashburn, they're all different because it's it's different to a club in the county because players are coming in and out at different stages and then availability mm -hmm. is very important. But players will become available and you'd have to tell a fella he's dropped. And you didn't really have an excuse because they played well during the league period. So... Why are you bringing in X, Y, or Z? Why am I finding myself not playing now? Yeah. You know, and you weren't given the your honest, your honest answer on it. And um, 
you know, they, they, look and, and and lost a relationship or two with those players for a while, you know, but built it back up. Then hopefully, you never know. Yeah. Uh, back, <laughs> We've been on a podcast in fifteen years. Thing on, geez, your man's yeah. class. <laughs> come to one of your last questions as well about you know what what you want to leave. You know, you don't you want those boys to be able to come up with you outside Crow Park in ten years time and chat to you. Like it's not always going to happen because you are mm-hmm. going to upset people. Yeah, but um. Yeah, I, honesty is definitely high up. And I, I learned from that day, those two boys who are still, they're, both of them are involved with them, both of them are involved with their clubs. They're, they're really good lads. But uh, I wasn't honest with them and uh, paid a price for it. Um, including including everybody in the process. I've been involved, in, and I'm sure we all have. You're involved in teams, and you have your WhatsApp group, and you have your players' WhatsApp group. But there could be 20 messages going on in the background mm-hmm. between coaches, between PAs, between players and stuff like that. Everybody needs to know what everybody is doing. You know, you, you, you can't have a situation where you're on the side of a field and you're going, why is that full of there? Oh, I talked to Johnny last week and we decided we'd, you know, move this. Yeah, but I don't know that. Fall in the stand doesn't know that. And the other players on the pitch don't know that. We we'd very, very high profile game. A game plan was um, decided uh, the Thursday night before a senior inter county match. And two minutes before throw in, uh, a manager told a key player to play his role differently. And we kicked up, we, we coughed up uh, three points from the player that he should have been marking in that first five minutes you know so from even the, the very start of where you're agreeing how you train your definitions of your kpis all that stuff all up to match day i think there has to be inclusivity with everybody 100 i i'm just thinking of a scenario in the last couple of years there and again I won't go too specific won't hang anyone out to drive but i gave instructions to the guy at half time about his role in the puck out and two minutes later the manager had told him he was playing somewhere else and we'd already yeah. had we'd already had our coaches meeting at halftime. We'd had our couple of minute meeting going right. This is what we're doing, and then gave the instruction and it changed. And it's like, but yeah, it's it's so important. It's again, if we go back to the two guys that worked with in Dublin, the Camogie, Colin Cod, Paul Heron, were big into these scenario sheets that you'd meet on a Thursday night and you'd try and just put down. Look, if our centre back gets injured, what do we do? If our midfielder gets injured, what do we do? Who's coming in? Do you know, if they're causing rack here, if the man marking is working, whatever. And try and take that impulsiveness and that kind of reactiveness because look, hurling is a crazy game. You get caught up in the energy of it and the battle of it, and mm-hmm. you know we, we can be impulsive. So we're like trying to remove that impulsivity out of the game by going, listen, as much as we can possibly predict here, if this happens, this is what we're doing. I think that can kind of, and then like to go back to what you said about inclusivity, like the key stakeholders were all included in that thought process. So very rarely would something happen in a game that we hadn't thought about. But everybody had the solution there on the sheet in their folder on the sidelines. So there was just yeah. very few surprises happening, you know. Um, yeah, that's that's very important. Like that's if there's any managers listening in particular, I think is to kind of like like I know we kind of have the cult of the manager and ultimately they're in charge, but you can cause absolute chaos if you go off on go off as the lone man and give different instructions and stuff. Yeah, the, and the last one there is it's about the collective, not the individual. And that goes from top to bottom. Like we do have egos as coaches, managers, whatever ourselves. But when you're making decisions on or off the field, it has to be about the collective, not the individual. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny enough, when I'm only kind of I'm nowhere near as far down my performance analysis journey as you are. But one of the one of my mottos for it is actually the exact opposite of that. But it's it it still applies is that you can't improve the collective without improving the individual. So nearly, yeah. but but the, that's just from a from a, coming from a point where I think sometimes the players kind of from twenty two to thirty get forgotten about, and we presume that just because they're coming to train and they improve, yeah, but it's it's a slightly different thing. But yeah, like I agree one hundred percent. Every decision you make has to be for the good of the collective. But that's not easy to do. Like, it's no, not easy to do. It it, it it isn't at times, but I think if you keep it in the back of your head and try and keep reinforcing it. Next question, Owen, kind of goes on from that. When you step away from a team, what three things would you like the players to say about you? 
Um, yeah, I kind of touched on one or two of them. All right. Um, the first one would be I facilitated their development. That I helped them develop. That you know that um, they became better players under my tutelage, and they can see that they have improved. That would be the main one. Mm-hmm. Um, they're in a better place both on and off the field um, than when I first met them. That, And when I say that, okay, it is about them as people as well, that they're better people, but I can't fully control that. I'm more on about that they understand the game better. It's when they go home and they're analysing their stuff that they're better at it. Mm-hmm. And the next person, because look, we only last in jobs so often. Like we are going to be handing over everything you've handed over, UL, uh, Camogie to somebody else, and I've handed over DCU, and we'll all move on from where we are. We have to like that the people that we hand over are in a better place than when they first arrived to us, um, both on and off the field. I, I, I and the last one, then I touched on it earlier that you can talk to them beyond the game. Mm-hmm. You know that if you meet them outside Crow Park or you meet them in any kind of um, any kind of standing, that fellas will come up. Now, I've had situations where there is a group, especially with the first few years in DCU. There's a group there of let's say Connor Delaney, John Donnelly, those kind of boys, um, Donald, obviously, fellas like that that still touch base, which you, you, you have that. But there's other fellas that you'd hope that if you met them down in Wexford Park or you met them in in um, what you call it, uh, Croke Park or wherever, or Parnell Park, they'll still come up and talk to you and have that. Mm-hmm. So it's the hope that, you know, that they relate to you as a person and you can relate to them as a person, not just a hurler or not just he was corner forward for me on a fresh routine back in whatever, 14, yeah. 15. Yeah, the soft skills. Gee, did you, under, you understand a bit about them outside the game and ultimately... Yeah, they're, they understand how they're getting on in their life, what they're yeah. doing. Stuff like that. I know it'd probably it'd be one or two players probably laugh <laughs> when they hear me say that, but yeah. I genuinely, genuinely do try to connect. Yeah, and yeah, so look, it's, I, it's like anything, on isn't it? It's, it's sometimes you just don't click with people. Like, is it, Joe, it, it happens. No. In all, it happens in all walk of life. Like as well, it's so it's sure it's there. Like there's other players, certain players over the years where you just click with straight away and. It's kind of you have that understanding with them and that that kind of a connection, and then there's other players. It's just just hasn't quite happened, and you know, it's sometimes yeah. it can be your best player you mightn't click with, and it could be someone number thirty five in the panel that you get on famously with, and it's it, it's not you know, it's it, it's look human dynamics are are just they're just they're kind of a they're an interesting um, interesting science, and it's it's hard to put your finger on it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you know, and like that's so what the collective dynamic as well. And, so if you're trying to connect with 35 people, then you name your first team for the first round of the Fitzgibbon, and there's 20 of them think you're. A... Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. Has Orla got a bleep machine? So I won't say it. But... <laughs> no, definitely. And yeah. look, and I, I know in my earlier career that I would have, um, gone towards the top end lads, and spent more time talking to them and connecting with them, and that's not what it's all about, especially with, especially well any team. But especially with club and college, you have to connect with those boys, you know, that aren't your top 10 hurlers and aren't your, because they're the ones to keep it going. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of, uh, it, it, it's the same, but a little bit different, especially at senior into county level, because there's different periods in the season where you have to be concentrating on what you're doing and it's a short season and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But definitely with club and Fitzgibbon, like, you know, you need to be connecting with the fellas. And I, I have been guilty of it of um focusing in on the top end and not focusing in on the the bottom end mm, yeah i think it's definitely something we've all we've all done i think uh, over the years um i'm going to ask you a question that kind of stopped me in my tracks one time on and it, it made me very much question what path i was on <laughs> but i couldn't answer it but what's your coaching ethos yeah these are ones that crop up that debates between coaches and stuff like that the whole time i remember doing I remember doing a coaching philosophy, you know, doing a project on that one time. And I remember doing a PA philosophy and doing an, and I kind of go, OK, you can have nice ideas and you can have nice philosophies and stuff like that. And again, it's very much determined by the team you're working with and the people around you and stuff like that. And what I broke it down to is how I actually coach 
and it's kind of going back to something I explained earlier on. So the first thing I do is, is, is a visual. Give the player a visual aid of the exercise that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So then you go onto the pitch, you'd walk through that exercise. So everyone has sees, okay, they've seen the visual. Now we put it on the pitch. Now we walk through it. Then you train it. And then you go through your different levels of training, whether it's unopposed, opposed, semi-opposed, whatever you want to do with it. So you train it. Then you play it. You got to play what you do. So you, you put that into your match situation. Then you analyze it. So you look at it, whether it's video, stat, whatever it is, you analyze what you played and then you tweak it. You bring it back to the pitch and you tweak it because generally it doesn't go the way you want it to. <laughs> So you go and you tweak whether it's a puck out defense, whether it's you're sitting on whatever line you want to sit on to defend a puck out or who you want to give up. And you find out, okay, the big switched it. And you've been caught with a slide press and your whole half of the field is, oh, okay, how do we fix this? Mm -hmm. What do we do here? So you visual, you walk through, you train, you play it, you analyze it, you tweak it. That's basically how I try and coach you. Yeah. And I suppose the beauty of that, you know, is regardless of what level you're at, um, regardless of what level the team are at or what stage of their progression are at, you can take that, I suppose, framework and apply it to any team. Like it's 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 easily transferable, I suppose, is the is the crucial thing. Yeah. As long as you've got the video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there's probably lads sitting at home going for it's all geez, these lads are always talking about videos. What if well, we don't have the video? If you don't have the video, you go from your eye. You have to, you know, it's yeah, not ideal, but you have to go with your eye, you know. Yeah. And I uh, look, there's there is um studies out there that show look video obviously once you watch it back a second time, you you take in an awful lot more of the game and stuff like that. But sometimes we just don't have it. And even at yeah. inter-county level, sometimes we don't have video because it just wasn't available on that day. Yeah. And even the odd time, the very odd time, now Nafina is different, nearly all our games are video, but the very odd time, we might get a game. So we have to go off, go off that, like, you know, so, yeah, you know, you have to work with what you have. <laughs> we went up to Belfast one day uh, last year with Dublin playing Antrim in a challenge. And... Uh, We'd kind of played maybe a, like a squad team, kind of maybe players who were kind of like 16 to 35, whatever. And we were absolutely atrocious. Like it was disastrous to the point of kind of going like, where are we going? And Antrim were supposed to video it and they didn't <laughs> for some reason. And I just stood up on the Monday night and I was like, right, guys, everybody who played on Sunday, you may ring Elaine Dowds and thank her. And they hardly even know she was. Sorry, that's the answer manager because if we had the video for that game, there would only be about 12 people sitting there today. <laughs> so sometimes not having the video can be good for your yeah. career. Yeah, it can be. <laughs> can be, yeah. So, um, okay, so we're at the point in this own where I'm going to let you turn the tables on me. Any of the guests that have been on, I'll let them ask me a few questions. So I'm going to put the spotlight on myself here and you can, you can fire away. Yeah. So the first one is... What motivates you to coach? Yeah. Um, I, I thought a good bit about this because I, I think it's sometimes we can lose sight of it. I think if you lose sight of it, um, you start kind of delivering poor work, I think. But um, the first thing really, if I go really back, was not having made it as a player. Like never got to experience those inter-county days and kind of big days out and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, I really want a taste of this. Like I want a taste of, you know, going in on the bus under the, under the stand in Crow Park and how, how can I do that? And the obvious answer was it, it, it was coaching, you know, so like that would have been, that would definitely be a motivating thing for me just to just really wanted to experience that top level, um, top level of the, of the game. Um, I suppose then as you, as you go along, then your motivation changes. And I suppose I kind of became a little bit addicted to kind of the, the, the change process and seeing improvements in teams and kind of trying to take a team from point A to point B and, how can we do it and improving players and stuff like that I think there, there's huge satisfaction in that um, then I suppose look as human beings I think somewhere deep down in our DNA we kind of all have this kind of a hunger to be part of something bigger like a kind of a collective movement um, I think like I love that I think, I'm think i not sure what order these podcasts are going out in but like, we often speak of the slump when a season finishes you know you kind of feel down on yourself and lacking energy and Part of what we discussed was that a lot of that is from not being part of the collective, you know, like you're so used to going to training and then there's 40 people there, coaches and players, and you're all trying to do the same thing and the crack of it and everything. And 
I love that. Like I love that trying to achieve as a group and the crack you have as a group and that bond you get as well. Um, so it's hugely motivating to kind of stay at a level where I can enjoy that. And then I suppose the last thing is I realized I'm I'm pretty good at it. Um, and like unlike my golfing career where I convinced myself if I go oh three times a week, I'd be unreal, which is never gonna happen. I kind of realized, look, if I put a lot of time into this and connect with people and kind of get good peers around me, that I could be quite good at it. Um, so that's a motivating thing for me is to stay at it. Do you know, like even when yeah. results don't go your way and stuff, it's like, no, you're like I'm all right at this. If I if I put a bit of time into it, like, I, I might be able to get somewhere with it. And that that's a motivating thing for me as well is to see where I can go with it, I suppose. Unlike the golf, which is going nowhere. <laughs> no, I, I, I can relate to all of those. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely the first one, yeah. 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 It's such definitely. a big thing, I suppose, especially, I suppose, we're lucky enough to be from Limerick as well. So I suppose we've been exposed to these big days as supporters and you're kind of sitting in the stand going, Jesus, what's it like to be down there? Like, you know, and it's just like, there's yeah. no way of making it as a player. I don't know what the other, other avenue is. You know, I'm not, I wasn't, I didn't get enough points to be a physiotherapist. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, I had an yeah. older brother, Joe, like Joe was fairly successful underage. So I spent a lot of time watching what he was doing. And I suppose I, didn't really get to his level so there's a lot of that yeah in it yeah yeah definitely yeah okay two more on use them wisely two more yeah what's been your greatest challenge as a coach uh this is interesting okay so again i put a lot of thought into this this is a really good question um and i was kind of thinking about like i suppose different challenges that popped up over over time right but i suppose they're more acute challenges kind of things you have to deal with in the here and now but i think the biggest challenge to me as a coach has been that i went in at a high level very early and i wasn't ready for it okay um so i suppose in 2014 i was involved in limerick Camogie with a real successful year we won a minor championship we won an intermediate championship we had a year at senior and then joe got the joe quay got the kildare job and i went in as the head coach at kildare and like my very first senior hurling competitive game was a national league game against Antrim above in Ballycastle. My very first game I was ever involved with as a senior coach. And I just remember coming down and we stopped somewhere in Dundalk. We got a hockey. And I just looked at Willie Banks. The two of us were pale as ghosts going like, what are we at here? Like we are so far out of our depth. Um, but I was very lucky. Peter Byrne, you might know, he was kind of involved with Paul's team there that won the Leinster 20s. Yeah, he was unbelievable. Two minutes down the road from me here. Oh, yeah, from Celebrate, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was class. And, like, he was the guy who really showed me how to coach senior hurling. And I suppose I was lucky that I learned from him. Um, but, look, that would have been the biggest challenge. And I suppose what I found when I went back to the minors then this year on in that I'd only ever coached senior teams, whether that was club level or county level, that my fundamentals, my basics weren't good enough for the minors. Because I suppose if you're okay. involved at senior level, a lot of what you're doing is kind of tactical stuff. It's game plan stuff. It's movement patterns, that kind of stuff, because you, you're they're kind of at a certain level already, or they should be anyway. Whereas I found when I went back to the minors, then what I was providing for them wasn't good enough with regards to, uh, I suppose, improving them as technicians, improving the technical side of their play. So that was a massive challenge for them as well, is to go in and kind of reassess where I was as a coach, the language I was using, my approach to it, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, look, I'm delighted that I that I have gone on that journey because if I had gone in as a coach of a junior team or an intermediate club team, there's no guarantee I would have got to where I was because it's so hard to get there. Right. So I'm grateful that I went in at the top, but it, like, it was a huge challenge, huge learning curve for me as a coach to try and even get anywhere near the level. Like we, like those times we'd be playing like Antrim and Westmead and like they're playing chess, we're playing checkers. Like it was like, it was just like, it was just different. Um, so yeah, that's been the biggest challenge. I think. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, I again, I, I can relate to it. Um, I'm probably in a better place now than I was in 2009. No, without question, in a better place now than I was in 2019 to coach mm -hmm. at a certain level, you know. So, yeah, but, but being aware of it, I think, is the most important thing. Yeah. If, if you're not aware, like, if you're, if you're thinking you're doing a great job. And I hear, yeah, I'm the man here. Around, Jesus, yeah. God. I'm a senior yeah, yeah. to coach. Yeah, his, this tracksuit, lovely. Yeah, yeah, you know, and big, you're making shite of it. You know, you have to understand when you're when when you're not. So. The big thing the Americans go for on is how many games have you coached? How okay. many games have you coached, right? And I tracked it there, so I I kept track of all the games over the years. And just last year, I 
I just passed my 50th senior championship match coached. Okay. So like, I think like even from a like from I suppose experience on the line and just like just draw. Sure, I could have called myself an intercounty coach in 2016 with Kalair. Sure, I wasn't like I wasn't even related to it. I just happened yeah. to be a coach of an intercounty team. Whereas I think yeah. I'm far I'm far closer to it now with that experience built up of those championship games. I think it's just it's it's seasons on it's seasons on the training pitch, games on the line, real games, real championship games. That's where you start to go right. I'm actually getting experience at this now and. Maybe if I get to 100 games or 150 games, which I suppose in hurling is a lot harder to get to because you don't have that many. Um, yeah, you don't have that many uh, championship games. Then I'd probably start to feel a bit more comfortable um, <laughs> in my skin. To be yeah, honest, yeah. Yeah, definitely yeah, it's tough. Tough going. Last question. Uh, yeah. I think this for me would be the one that I is the most, who do you look for feedback from on your coaching and why? Yeah, look this this is this is a really interesting one and. So the, the probably the straight answer is I don't, right? If, if I'm being brutally honest with myself, right? Or, or for, for, I suppose, meaningful feedback anyway, right? Um, I have a, I'm in a peer group. There's four of us in a peer group uh, on WhatsApp and we coach at different levels and different teams and we were constantly just throwing out scenarios and stuff to each other. So that, that's more of a learning thing, right? Um, I was very lucky that, say, in Dublin, I had Colm Codd, Paul Ahern. Colm was the analyst selector, Paul Ahern, sports psychologist. And between the two of them, they gave me quite a lot of feedback on my on simple things like body language, um, my behavior on the line, um, your coaching language, things like that. Um, okay. But I'd love, so there's a guy called Ross Corbett that he was, he was involved in Camogie for a while and then he went to the Sydney Swans, but he's after doing a project with Limerick Academy. Uh, for his PhD, whereby he videoed the coaches and had them mic'd up and okay. for a whole season. Um, yeah. I'd love to do something like that and actually get proper feedback on what I'm saying during sessions. Because like, okay, if, if you went to the to Mick Kevill, Dublin minor manager, he'd go, oh, yeah, geez, Sully was class. But like, I'm kind of going, does he think I'm class because I always have a smile on my face and I'm running around the place and I bring a huge energy to it? Or am I actually good at coaching? I think so. I think you have to be kind of careful who you get feedback from as well. And I would love to go and get proper feedback. Maybe it's something Orla could do with us. We could, we could make a series out of it. Mic us up on the line, which would be dangerous, and 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 video us and actually just see what are we actually delivering to the players and what are we delivering to the players versus what we expected to deliver and is it is it close to what we envisage going out and that kind of stuff and. Yeah, so the straight answer for you on is I probably don't get proper meaningful feedback from anyone. Okay. Um, I get some sort of feedback from a number of different areas, but it's something I would love to do, yeah. What about yourself? Throw it, back um, to it. it comes back to, look, Paul is the kind of the fellow I, I hop off the most. Um, we have completely different ideas and how hurling is played and how to coach it and stuff like that. So it's good that both of us aren't just like nothing dogs. Mm -hmm. So Paul would be the one that I would definitely... Uh, go to for feedback Peter Byrne who you spoke of there I've done work with Peter and I, I, I've used Peter a lot um, he, he's excellent very very honest he's not afraid to tell it as it is mm -hmm. um, but the one I go back to is the players I like the players to tell me did they understand that did they get value from it did it help them um, did they understand what we're trying to achieve um, and the first few times I did that it can be hard to listen to mm -hmm. You know, because it's when did I start doing it? Um, started doing it about three or four years ago. After the year I had with the Dublin seniors, I started doing it. So about 2020, I'd say. And there is things you don't want to hear. You know, <laughs> you could have spent that's, half that's, an hour doing something and you could ask a player and he's telling you and you're going, that's not what I was trying to achieve. That's not what I was trying to do. And you kind of have to go and go, oh, kid, I didn't get my message across. That didn't land. So I've just wasted 30 minutes, you know, and you you find then, like you're saying, it, it's important to go to, you know, there's certain people that understand, you know, what's happening on the pitch and there's certain people in groups and teams that will give you honest, there, there's always those that will tell you what you want to hear, you know, yeah. because will I be picked on Saturday? Yeah. You know, I, I better tell him something, but there is that, then, then, then you find the people that go, okay, he's going to tell me you did that right. Or we know what we're doing, or that clicked, or it didn't, and you, you kind of go to them, 
you know. So yeah, between yeah, um, other coaches as well. I, I'd often ask a coach to watch what I'm doing um, mm-hmm. and see do they understand what what what's happening. And and that process is all the more easier by having the visual of the exercise, having the walkthrough, having the you know once you go the through con- that process, the of what you're trying yeah, to because achieve. they understand. Okay, this is what he's trying to achieve in this exercise, so I can talk to him about it afterwards. So yeah. that helps. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's it's a brave thing to do to go to your players, isn't it? Because you say, like, you have to be so open to getting it between the eyes at times. And um, it's interesting about the other coaches. I find like the GA can be quite insular. You know, I think these conversations that I'm having with you and I like, see the other guests, um, David Herity, Shane Hassett, they're very open. I think, but GA coaches have only become maybe that open in the last couple of years. Is kind of it's all very much a look. I invented the game now, and this is how I do it, and I'm not going to tell you anything. And all this kind of stuff. So it's it's all that pure feedback. The fooler, I think we've invented something. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tr- yeah. You know, there, there's nothing new. There's yeah. nothing new out there. No. You know, you you think you're, you're you're, and the fact of the matter is, it's about who does it better. Yeah. Who's able to implement it better? Yeah. You know? there's, there's a bit and, of a confidence in that as well, Owen, isn't there? Like you invite someone into a session and say, look, you can not nah, 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 I don't mean that, but uh, you can take all the notes you want, but like I still back myself to deliver this better because I know the nuances of it and I know why I'm doing it, you know. So like you can have all the you can have all the drills you want, but if you don't understand it's, it, but it's very funny. We were, I was at a coaching conference there last year and uh Mark Dunn Crokes Dublin yeah. was actually implementing a specific exercise and Mark You're there is the Nafina coach, obviously. Yeah, Nafina coach, <laughs> coach, coach. <laughs> And Martin Barry was standing beside me. I think it was Martin was standing beside me and he was doing something. He goes, how would you do it? And uh, I said, completely different the way he's doing it. (laughs) So it just shows, you know, look, we all do different things in different ways. We all have our own way of of doing things. And and look, Mark is excellent at what he does, obviously. Yeah. Uh, But it was just funny to see the two different and for another coach to ask you, would you do it that way? And I go, no. No, maybe that's where yeah. I'm going wrong. <laughs> no, but that's, that's the fascinating thing is like it's like that's why I love doing these. Is just we're all trying to ultimately get to the same point where your team is performing well enough to win. But there's so many different ways of getting there. It's just yeah. like it's it's fascinating. It really is. Um, final question on yeah, thirty years time you hang up the whistle. Yeah, you might get thirty years out of yourself yet. Um, what's the one achievement you want to have in the bag? Uh yeah yeah that this is a it's a good question and, and I can't answer it because and it, it's changed over the years when I started off I wanted to win every All Ireland that was ever made <laughs> and wanted to have a bag full of medals and you know be the most successful it, it just doesn't happen that way you know you have to be realistic with yourself you're going to lose more than you're going to win maybe I lose more than most <laughs> but um like I two All Ireland <laughs> well, Ireland minor semi-finals last. I wanted to really win a minor. I'm actually back in that process to hopefully get there again. But you can never go. I want to win a minor. You got to have to go through the process and get the best team out. Yeah, uh, two goals off that didn't happen. Uh, I lost two fit semi-finals and a fit final. Like Fitzgibbon for me is very. I, I was lucky enough to play in good colleges teams, and it's it's a massive part mm-hmm. of me as a coach and me as a manager. But I kind of have to park it and kind of go, what will happen will happen. Prepare your team as best you can. And you might win a Fitz, you might not. You know, James Dunno, who is over, is in Wexford. He spent five, six years with me between freshers and Fitz and stuff like that. And we didn't win it. And it's one of the things that, you know, upsets him an awful lot. But, you know, we were involved. We were at the, the, the top end of that for a couple of years, and it was extremely enjoyable. We didn't win it, so be it. Um Moving on to the FINA, I've lost two county finals with the FINA. There's nothing more than I'd like to win a county final with the FINA, of course. Mm. But you're not in control of that. Yeah, You know, you have to prepare the team as best you can, put the things in the best place that they can. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, and you talk about the slump time, Jesus, like those <laughs> weeks after losing county finals or fits finals or minor finals or semifinals, you know, being able to deal with them and look and it goes back to me being sick a couple of years ago mm. you have to put things in context you know you do have to put it we're we're we're, we're privileged we're involved mm. in good setups and it's very enjoyable but at the end of the day it's hurling and i know it's 
probably the most important things in our lives. Yeah. But you have to you have to park it and you have to kind of go, okay, it didn't happen yeah. for whatever reason, and you gotta move on. Yeah, there's a guy, there's a guy who was involved with Kieran McDermott, um, real class guy. I think he was that he might have been actually a selector on that UL, that class UL team you ran into blowing Mallow that the they were they were outrageous. Yeah, I think Mikey Casey and Sean Finn came on as subs. <laughs> yeah, Kyle Hayes was over 24. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the luxury then he go wing back, but his big thing was he said pure sport. And his 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 philosophy was once you can acknowledge that in the general scheme of things in life that sport doesn't matter, but you're still willing to give every ounce of your being to it. He says that's the purity of it. He's like you've you've acknowledged that in the, it doesn't really matter. But you can find that collective cause and still be willing to give everything to it. And uh, we, we played um, we played a challenge match one night with you all blowing St. Pat's, wet night, January, about twelve people at it, and Galway were after winning the All Ireland, and we were after winning the Ashburn, and the two teams went hell for leather at it, blowing Pat's, and the game ended up a draw. I remember Kieran just coming out going, nobody will ever remember that game, but that's why we get involved in sport. That was pure, like there was nothing on the line here. Um, but it's all, as you say, it's all put in the perspective of it not really mattering at the end of the day, you know. But we still give everything to it. We so still give everything, and it takes up so much part of our lives. Yeah, but, yeah. Oh, look, I, 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 I never even mentioned Liam McCarthy because I think I parked that one now at this stage. <laughs> <to win. laughs> but, I, I went for a job interview, and not a job interview, but a, a manager was looking for a coach, and he asked me to sit down with him, and we were going to have a chat about whether it would work or whatever. And he asked me something similar to that kind of. That's why I asked it because I'm kind of curious. And I'd say he thought I was the most cynical man of all time. And he said, what was my ambition, John? What's my goal? And I was like, listen, lad, I stopped having goals and ambitions in, in sport a long time ago because if you're operating at the elite level, you're a bounce of a ball or a, a referee's decision or a mistake away from losing. You mightn't have a job next year. I said, you can't go, well, I'm going to take the Dublin minors now and then I'll have the Dublin 20s in two years. And then, geez, I might get back to the Limerick seniors. And then we went to Lee McCarthy. It's like, Nah, all you can do it when you're at our level is take the next job, give it absolutely everything, do it to the best of your ability. Whatever happens out of that would happen. You know, it might be good enough, might be not good enough. If people see you're giving your, your best and you're good enough, you might get another opportunity out of it. That's it. I think the idea is setting we all look, we all have our dreams. You're lucky, yeah. It'd be, yeah. Great the, it'd be great to go up the Hogan stand, wouldn't it? And get your hands to Lee McCarthy. Sure, who wouldn't want to do that? But I think if you set that out as your out and out goal and Every time you're doing a job, I think you, you lose sight of the of what's in front of your face, I think, really. But, yeah. Owen, that was absolutely thoroughly enjoyable. I have a page full of notes made here of stuff you've said for my own uh, for my own uh, learning. So And and likewise um, with your questions, yeah. <laughs> I hope the listeners uh, got something out of it as well. Orla's going to stick up the links, but for anyone that's interested in seeing a bit more of what Owen's about, it's on Twitter, it's at no plan B G A A, uh, the GA performance process. Uh, so check the lads out there, breakdown games and everything is top class. And Owen, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I genuinely mean that. Um, and look, thanks very much for your time. 100%. No problem, Adrian.